All right. So, so just two things I want to talk about then, since we don't need to talk about basic derivatives and, and intervals and all that, um, is integration, um, specifically integration of ordinary differential equations or solving ordinary differential equations. That's differential equations with one uh, one variable, one dimension, let's say. And uh, we'll also talk about just the concepts of Fourier transform, just enough to understand the assignment, and and also other things that, like the sort of flavor of problems that you can use the Fourier transform for. Um, all right, so first one is the easier one, and that's uh, integration of ordinary differential equations. So let's take, for example, um, what we are, uh, let's see, y of t uh, is equal to y of t. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so that's a differential equation. It means expressing a relationship between the derivatives. It, it's an equality relation. You can solve these things. It looks kind of funny if you haven't seen differential equations before, but it does make some sort of sense. Like the function itself, the values at every time, are equal to the slope at that time point. So this one is solved by uh, one of t. I'm not going to write the general solution. I'm just going to write a particular solution. The family of solutions is some constant times e to the t. And how do we know that? Because dy of t dt is just e to the t. The derivative is equal to the original function. That makes sense? The concept of this differential equation, the solution is this. So we can guess and check, or we can solve these numerically. Okay, and the way that you solve it numerically is, well actually let's take then the, uh, the uh, we need to, let's see. All right, in order to solve numerically, you have to have it also in an initial condition. So you have to say that something else you need to know is that the value of, well, let's, let's see why. Because the general solution is actually C times, plus C? Derivative, I think it's time, isn't it time C? It's a different way to write it now. So if yeah, I, I see. Yeah, but I'm going to do, do times. C e to the t. Right? So that's the general solution because y prime t is equal to also c e to the t. Okay, that makes sense. So this is the general differential uh, equation, and then you turn it into what's called an, an initial value problem when you specify that y at time uh, zero has to be equal to, say, one. So this helps you lock down what the value of c needs to be. So we can plug that into our equation. We say y of 0 is equal to c times e to the 0 is equal to 1. We know that. And so that leaves us with c is equal to 1. All right, so the solution to our actual initial value problem is y of t is equal to e of the t. The constant has dropped out. And we've gotten rid of the constant based on our initial condition. And so in order to solve an initial value problem numerically, what you do is you start out at the initial condition. You say, here's my t, and here's my y. All right, my value of t is 0. And I know that at time 0, my value of y is 1. So here's where I'm going to start out. All right? Does that make sense? OK, well, my differential equation then says that the slope here is equal to whatever the value is. So my value is 1, so my slope is 1. What does the slope mean? It's this, it's this sort of thing. So it's like the line going off a tangent line, in a sense. So what I do is I take a very, very, very tiny step in my time, travel for a very tiny amount of time, and I go at a slope of positive 1. And then I have my next time point. And so I've got, like, let's say time is is delta, okay? Delta, de I'm taking steps in time of size delta. We'll make those equal to point 0.1 for now to make it easy, okay? So this is point 0.1. Well, if I went up with a slope of 1 over, uh, let's actually expand this so, it, so it's not so, so small. So this is going to be my delta. It's going to be, it looks like it's a large step, but it's actually a small number. 
delta is equal to 0 0.1. So this is 0 0.1 here. Okay. So I'm going to take a step over. So this is 1, this is 2, etc. All right. And so I, my slope of positive 1 actually looks very shallow like that. So that's where I end up. And what, what, is, what is this value of, of, of at, uh, y here? I went over with a slope of 0.1. I went, uh, excuse me, with a slope of 1 over a delta of 0.1. So I rose my rise. This is my slope is my rise over run. So I'm 0.1 above where I started. So this has got to be at y is equal to 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah? Okay. So then I say, all right, now I'm here. And my derivative is equal to the value of the function itself. The value of the function itself is 1.1. So I draw a little bit steeper line. It's like a little bit steeper. This is a slope of 1.1 instead. And so I take another tiny little step. And I say, well, I went over, I went over 0 0.1. 0 0.1 times 1. What? Can I get a chair? Yeah, just grab that chair over there. I went over 1.1 1. Uh, 1 and had a slope of 1.1. I don't know what the height difference is. It's like 0.12 or something like that. And you go up by that much. So the, these, the strategy for solving these differential equations numerically is you start off from the initial condition and you take little steps in time and you add up the change in height every time and you look based on the differential equation. The differential equation tells you what the slope is at every time. At every point. Let's, let's do another example. You get an array of y values. Yeah, exactly. So you don't you you don't get the solution of y of t is equal to e of t. You get, however, the solution of y at all these discrete time points. Y equals delta. Y equals two delta. Y equals three delta, etc., etc. Yeah. So we can draw like polynomial of y. Well, this one's. Actually, going to be exponential, right? So, I mean, yeah, but you kind of get smoothing. You could then do some smoothing. Yeah, sure, you could fit a curve to it. That's not necessarily the best way to go, but that is one way you could do. Spline. Hmm? Uh, spline. Yeah, you could do a spline. Sure. Yeah. So this is a what's called a forward Euler, a first. It's also it's called a first order method, um, because as you in decrease the time step, so like, let's imagine that. Um, our, our approximate solution is, we'll say, y of t, um, and so like at, at particular time points, we've got the solution y tilde at time 0, 0.1, etc. We've got the solution at all those times. And then we want to also maybe compare that to the true solution. Okay, so the true solution is just y at that time. This, this is a little bit, this is not actually important for the class. This is just a little bit of the terminology and what you might remember. The absolute value of the difference between these, these get closer and closer. The approximation gets closer and closer to the exact answer as, as the value of delta gets smaller. Does that make sense? The smaller the step I take, the closer to the definition of the derivative that we're getting at here, right? So that sort of makes sense intuitively. This is called a first order method that if I, decrease the time step by a factor of two, by half the time step, then this error goes down by about two. If I, you know, if I had a second order method, and if I decrease the time step by a factor of two, this becomes 0 .00, 0 0.05, then this would go down by a factor of four. A third order method, this would go by down by a factor of eight, etc. So it gets a lot better accuracy. So this is called a first order method because it's not very accurate. You can do more accurate approximations. We're just saying, all right, we're going to take the value of the derivative at this point and go over this amount, and we're going to draw the, the slope line. There's ones that take, what was the derivative, not, not just this time, not just right now, what was the derivative at the last time? What was the one derivative at the time before that? And based on how those derivatives are changing, that kind of gives you some second derivative information. You can make your method more accurate. So that's just a little bit of conceptual understanding of how you can get more accurate methods. This is called a forward Euler method. Euler, this was called, first of all, Euler method is the, the name for the two. There's two first order methods. And uh, Euler gets his name attached to both ones. Your t and here's the way to write it. So your y at time, um, 
T plus delta is equal to your y at time t plus the derivative of y at t plus delta, t, t times delta. It's Taylor series expansion, and you can see there, based on the Taylor series, why it's first order. You, it, that's how they get to this first order approximation, by the way. What, what's going on? Hey, hi. What did she say? Um, she said she just sent. She said you, she sent it to you a little bit ago. But she um, <coughs> she just resent it to you. Okay. All right. I'll take a look. But I'm not. I can't do that right now. No worries. Do you want me to like write down my name? Um, why don't you send, just send me another email? Okay. And that'll get bring it to the top of the inbox. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep, sure thing. Okay. So there's another. There's also a back forward Euler means we're projecting forwards in time. There's another way of doing this. That y of t plus delta you can actually say that it should be y of t plus, yeah, this. So another way of looking at it, this is uh, slightly different. This turns out to be an implicit equation. Um, that you, it's a little bit harder. You have to solve for it. It's not just uh, taking steps linearly. You have to solve a system instead. All right, so that's a little bit of terminology. That's not too important. The conceptual part that's important is that you look at the slope, you look at where you are now, and you go over by a small increment, and you find out where your next step is. Make sense conceptually? OK, so that's how you solve initial value problem numerically with a computer. Now, the important part for the assignment, though, is one thing that people have trouble with is what if you have a system of differential equations? Okay, so we're let's let's look at one differential equation. Uh, x. Um, uh, oh, first of all, actually, let's look at a second order. So, y double prime of t plus y prime of t plus y prime of t. Oh, y of t. There we go. Is equal to. Yeah, is equal to zero. That's my differential equation. Okay. Now the solution to this uh, is actually some sines and complex exponentials and the general solution. But um, so let's say we don't know that. Now we just we want to solve an initial value problem numerically. So we end up with uh, let's see. We've got to specify where we start. What's y at time zero? Let's say it's equal to zero. And y prime at zero. Let's say is equal to one. You've got to get, it's a second order equation. You learn this sort of thing in math, and this is actually, I'm not, we, we said we didn't have to review basic calculus, so I'm not going to re review that part. But conceptually, in order to integrate this forward in time and find the solution and narrow it down to exactly one function, you'll find that because this is second order, we've got a second time derivative in here, you're going to need to not only know the value of the function at a time, but also the value of the slope at a particular time. Okay. But you say, how do I apply the technique that I had before, right? The technique that I showed before was I start out at time 0. OK, so I'm at y 0 is 0. So I, here's my first point. But I need to know the slope if I want to go at a certain small step, right? I can't do that here because I've got this y double dot that's screwing things up. My, my, my method only works for first order equations. And so the way that you can do it is to transform this single first order equation into a system of two independent, well, not, they don't even have to be independent, two uh, first order equations. I'll show you how, what I mean. This looks like I'm just playing around with, not, with, with letters, but it, it makes a conceptual distinction. If I define z1 to be y, and I define z2 is y prime. Let's make some substitutions, OK? What we find then is that uh, what is z1 prime? What is it? It's equal, yeah, that's right. You jump straight to that. Well, z1 prime is the same as y prime, but that's equal to z2. What is z2 prime? z2 prime is, uh, well, let's, let's find out. z2 so prime is prime. y prime. That's equal to y double prime, right? 
But what's y double prime equal to? Let's rearrange the equation. y double prime is equal to negative y prime of t minus y of t. Right? So that is equal to, oh wait a second, so we can write it like this, y prime of t minus minus y of t. Well, let's substitute back in the z's. This is minus z2 minus z1. Okay. And so now we end up with actually two equations then. We say that z1 prime is equal to z2, and z2, this is just what we have there, is equal to negative z2 minus z1. So we've broken this equation into two separate first order differential equations. Whereas this one had second order term, this one had first order term. And so it's kind of hard for me to write the solution on the chalkboard, but it turns out this can be integrated in exactly the same way. If we let this, say z is z1, z2, then we can find the solution to the differential equation involving z prime. We can say z prime, uh, my differential equation is now in z. So I can say that z at time t plus delta is equal to z at time t plus z prime at t times delta. Does that make sense? And we can, this is something that we can calculate with. It turns out to be pretty, pretty easy. You can write this uh, whole thing as a matrix um, or as a, not actually not as a matrix, this just becomes a, these are just vectors now. It becomes pretty easy to work with. Yeah, so if that's z, then z prime is equal to z2 and negative z2 minus z1. Yeah. So you can, you can perform, think about performing this numerically. There's nothing wrong with doing this. Okay, so that's how you do multi higher order differential equations. I could do that with one in the third order, fourth order, etc. And then what do you do if you have systems of second order differential equations. Let's say I've got z, oh no, I'm going to give it another letter, right? x double prime is equal to y prime t minus x of t. Some wacky thing like that. Well, that's nasty. Well, all I've got to do is just start assigning letters z1, z2, etc. to the different um, derivatives. Okay, so I'm going to let z1 is going to be uh, y. Uh, let's start with x. Let's start with x. Is x and z2 is equal to x prime, and z3 is equal to um, x double prime, and z4 is going to be y, and z5 is going to be y prime, and z6 is going to be y double prime. Okay, so we've already got things in kind of a nice way. So we can say that that's the substitution I'm making, but now I need to find out what z1 prime is. What's the derivative of z1? Yeah, z2. Yeah, that's right. And what's the derivative of z2? C3. Yeah, it's just C3. So some of them are going to be trivial. It looks like I'm just playing around with numbers, but really the way to think of it is they're just really easy to do. All right, and then what's the derivative of Z3? X double prime, it's this guy here. Well, what's that? That's Z5 minus, minus Z1. Yep, cool. Great, excellent. And so we just continue with that. Z4 prime. That's going to be z5, z5 prime is going to be z6, very easy. And finally we get to z6 prime is equal to, well, negative z5 minus z4. Okay. And so now we have a differential equation, z prime 
is some function of z. We really have, instead of this system of equations, we've transformed it into z prime is some function of z. In this case, the function is actually can be represented as a, as like um, um, a, a matrix times the, yeah, I guess, you, well, I'm not going to write out that big matrix, but. What's that? Some yeah, times a vector of z's. Yeah, it's like um, z equal to a times z. Yeah, that's right. And we just get the coefficients. That's actually maybe um, a of z times z. That's the way to write it. It's going to be constant, no? Oh, no, you're absolutely right. It's going to be constant. In this case, in this case, I could have a nonlinear one. In which case, you can't necessarily separate it like that. Okay, so, but you can see how you can follow the same procedure. Then I'm going to say z at time zero is equal to this vector. And then z at the next time step is, well, just calculate what these are. Because I know, I know this, I know that, I know that. Because at my initial time, I know what the answer is. So I can calculate z prime. And I just go over a small step in time. And then I add on the, the change in height, basically, for each of those variables independently. Does that make sense? OK, so that's how conceptually we're going to solve ordinary differential equations or um, initial value problems in Python. And I just need you to understand that, um, that concept. All you need to be able to do is take a system. The most important thing is to be able to take a system like this and reduce it into a, an equation like z prime is some function of z. Because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to specify to a scipy function. It's called like, let's, let's assume it's called ODE. There's actually several different ones, but let's say it's that. We're going to provide this function f. And we're going to provide z at time 0. Conceptually, this is not what it's going to be, but you're going to provide what that function is that goes on the right. So it's giving you the slope, basically. And then you're going to give it at the time, time 0, what all the different values of z are. Does that make sense? OK. OK. So that, that's um, conceptually all you need. And you know, when we get into that part of the class, you know, you'll get some examples. But this is what they're doing. Okay. So that's, that's the uh, initial value problem sort of thing. And then let's talk a little bit about fast Fourier transform. And because I'm not a math person, I'm an engineer, I think about this t intuitively, and I'm not very good at the details of it. Um, but it serves me fine for my purposes, all right? And so I'm hoping that I can teach you the intuition without the hardcore math that goes on behind it. And the idea comes from, all right, let's think about what happens when we have two functions. Okay. One is this sort of sine wave. I probably should have centered it around zero. Okay. And the other one is this sine wave. I want you to think about conceptually then what is y1 plus y2. What is that graph going to look like? I'm going to replace this. It's going to be a wave that's like. It's going to be a wave that's like less than this one on top of that one. You just if you add, it turns out that if you were to plot these each and you were to you were to calculate the value here and what's the value here and you add the two, you can just add the values point by point, and you'll find that it sort of makes sense conceptually. This is going to be like a small sine wave on top of a, a larger sine wave, something like that. Okay. That's adding functions. Let's think about the opposite process. If I told you. I've got this function that's called y3. It looks like this. And I ask you to break it down into components. I want you to give me two sine waves that it's the sum of. It turns out that there's a way of finding, in some sense I'm being kind of loose here, 
but there's a way of finding the two, how much of each of these two sides. I, I, maybe I tell you, like, you've got this sine wave. Okay, I'm not telling you the amplitude. And you've got this sine wave. I'm also not telling you the amplitude. I'm just telling you the frequency. There's a way of finding out what the, what the amplitudes of these two things have to be in order to give you this. And that's kind of the job of the Fourier transform, is you take a signal like this guy, and you break it down into its component frequencies, and you find out how much of each frequency there is in the original signal. Do the words that I'm saying make sense so far? It's like or it's like a circle. So it's just a serious, right? So, yeah, yeah. So I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking in any precise terms. I'm talking about conceptually. And I think that this is conceptually important enough to be able to break down. So like, let's say that you hear a musical a note, okay? And we all know that, uh, uh, music and it is sound, and sound is waves of pressure in the air, and you can imagine waves of pressure in the air as being, um, like if you were to take a pressure measurement uh, in a particular place, you would find the pressure goes up and down, and it forms some sort of crazy s signal, okay, through time, okay? But we also know kind of that sound is made up, we think of it often as like music is made up of multiple frequencies, right, different notes that are played. It turns out that you can take this, and you can take all those different notes, and you can find out how much of each note must have been played here. That's kind of counterintuitive, but if you have enough notes, then you can always make up the original signal. It turns out that regardless of what this is, even if it doesn't look like a sinusoid, even if it looks like, you know, something wild, okay, something crazy like that, it turns out that if you have enough frequencies, enough sines and cosines, it turns out you need the cosines as well. You can, you can find out if you say, I've got enough of these sines and cosines, tell me what the coefficients on them should be, what magnitude is of each of this. There's a way of solving this problem for how much of each sine and cosine do you need to make up this signal. That's conceptually what the fast Fourier transform is doing. I'm blurring over a lot of important details. But conceptually, does it make sense? Let me tell you some example applications. You hear, you know, you know that um, electrical outlets are um, 60 hertz. You've heard that the power oscillation is 60 hertz. Well, let's say my camera. Mm, let's let's think about something. Mm, let's say I'm making a tape recording. Do you guys know magnetic tapes? Uh, okay. <laughs> so like when I was recording uh, back. My mom was a music teacher, so we did a lot of like her playing piano, me singing tapes for her kids and stuff like that. So she'd turn on the record button, and I'd start singing, and she'd play the piano, and so the recording picked up our notes that we were singing and playing on the piano. But it also, because everything inside there is wires, it, it turns out that there's a, uh, the way electromagnetism works is you've got 60 hertz uh, wall power, that can be picked up, it's like radio transmission, on the wires of the tape recorder. And so in addition to the um, music that we were making, you would also hear this constant hum at a frequency of 60 hertz. Okay, This is a very common problem. That's why it's called electrical noise. I'm not making this, this is a very practical sort of thing. And if you could break down the music we were making into component frequencies, and assume that we were not singing anything at 60 hertz, because I don't think that my voice gets down as low as 60 hertz, nor are many piano notes are being played at 60 hertz. That's a pretty low note. Um, you would find that you can get rid of all the 60 hertz. So let's say you find all the frequency components, how much of each of those are. Say, I want zero at 60 hertz. Add up all the rest you'd get the original signal back that was just me and my mom playing piano and none of that 60 hertz wall noise. That make, uh, or electrical noise, excuse me. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's a, an example application. Denoising, getting rid of noise. In fact, that's what, that's what your assignment's gonna be. I was gonna say, is that the, 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 the annoying guy? Yeah, woo guy. 
Another example, and this was on the final exam last year, I'll distribute this at some point. You can identify musical instruments that are being played based on the Fourier transform. Okay, so I'm going to give you a sound of a musical instrument playing a note. Okay, you break it down into component frequencies. It turns out that when a trumpet plays uh, a, a pitch that I could sing, and you have an oboe doing it and me singing it, it turns out that there's not just that single note that's playing. You know that a trumpet sounds different from my voice singing. The trumpet sounds much better. The trumpet has, in addition to... And now, we've got to get out more. So let's say I tell a trumpet to play a middle C, or I think an A440. Okay, that means a 440 hertz sine wave. Okay? I tell a trumpet to play that. It turns out that when a trumpet plays it, it has what's called overtones, which are multiples of this frequency, that are, and um, certain multiples that are on top of it. And so the sine wave is not a perfect sine wave. The perfect sine wave, by the way, sounds very bad to our ears. It's very mechanical and tinny and nasty. But when you've got this, uh, a trumpet that plays it, it's got these overtones that are multiples of that frequency on top of it that change the shape just a little bit. You can still recognize it as being primarily a 440 hertz wave, but it's got these overtones on top of it. So if you look at the coefficient, so what we do, this is the way we often visualize it. So I told you that we're gonna find what component of each note there is. So let's say that we've got, here's 440 hertz, the note I told the trumpet to play. And we look at how much of 880 there is, and how much of, uh, I don't know, what's the next one, 1320? Is that right? I think that's right. Is that right? Okay. And so on and so on. What you're going to find is, well, how much of the 440? Well, there's a lot of that, okay? So we can visualize it as there being a lot of 440. There's also going to be some 880. There's also going to be some 1320. Does that make sense based on what I said? We're adding overtones, multiples of that 440 on there. And that's what makes a trumpet sounds like a trumpet. I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's the idea. We can identify which musical instrument it is based on what the shape is of this curve. We can say, what's the proportion of this to that? What's the proportion of this to that? And so maybe my voice looks is, is nasty because <laughs> Because I've got a lot of this going on, right? And that's no good. That's that's something the trumpet doesn't have. Or maybe when an oboe plays it, well, this one's a little bit higher and this one's a little bit lower. So based on the shape of the what's the fast Fourier transform, this is in a sense the fast Fourier transform. We can identify what musical instrument is playing. I think there's actually a lot of this sort of thing going on when we're talking about, you know, Alexa. I'd be very surprised if, if, if she was analyzing the signal in what's considered to be the time domain. She's probably analyzing a lot of the signal in the frequency domain, which is one of the component frequencies inside it. So I'm not going to get too much into the details. I'm going to say a few more notes, okay? So conceptually, that's what the fast Fourier transform is doing. It's finding out how much of each frequency there is in the original signal. Now, that's the concept. Now, if you've already done Fourier transform and not fast Fourier transform, if you've already done the continuous versions of these things, you'll find that everything can be the tra transform is some integrals and maybe. Uh, it, it looks a little bit different. Now we're thinking in terms of discrete frequencies. How much of frequency one is there? How much of frequency two? How much of frequency three, etc. What section are you on now? So that's that's one difference that's important. Another thing you'll find is that it turns out that when you do the okay, so that's that's the idea of discrete Fourier transform. We want to know at certain times what is here's the, here's my signal. At certain times, here's the value. I'm gonna I'm gonna sample it. Oh yeah, that's something I should say. Okay. So let's take a for example sound. I said it was pressure waves in the air, right? So in order to represent sound on a computer, it turns out what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a measurement of the pressure at each of many time points. Okay. I don't know what sound looks like as a function. I don't have a function f of t, and here's my sound. All I know is that at time is zero. I measured my pressure to be here. At time two, I measured my pressure to be here. At time three, I measured my pressure to be there. Okay, so all we have on our computer are discrete measurements of the, the pressure. 
what we want to do is turn then these discrete measurements. We say we've got all these measurements. We want to turn those into a bunch of different frequencies. Okay. So, what frequencies would I have to add up? How much of each frequency would I have to add in order to get these values at these different times? That's that's the discrete nature of it. And there's a special way of picking what those frequencies are so that you're not losing or adding any more information. I forget exactly what the formula for those frequencies are, but it depends on what dt is, how much time is in between the samples, and that, that will tell you what your frequencies are going to be. They're going to be multi, you've got like 100 samples? Okay, fine, you're going to have 100 frequencies. And you can find that 100 frequencies can add up to this. All right, last thing I want to say is that it turns out that, and I'm going to gloss over the details, I told you that it takes not just sines, sine waves, not just cosine waves, you need sums of the two. So you're not actually going to get just a number, a real number that is this much of sine wave zero, this much of sine wave two, this much of sine wave three, etc. You're actually going to get, at frequency zero, you've got a complex part. It's going to be like A plus BI, or one part plus one imaginary part, or two imaginary parts, etc. The real and the imaginary parts have to do with the amount of sine and the amount of cosine, is one way to think about it. Okay? It's, kind of, it's not quite as simple as that, but that's what the real and imaginary parts are for. But it turns out in this class, for the most part, we don't care too much about what the difference is between the real and imaginary part. We only really care about the total amount at that frequency. We don't care whether it's made up of sines or cosines. So that's another important thing to do. So you're going to see that in the examples, they're going to take the complex, the magnitude of it. And if we want to do a, a brief review of complex numbers, okay, we often think about this is the real part of a number, and this is the imaginary part of a number. So if your coefficient, if you say my coefficient on sine wave zero is uh, one plus zero point five square root of negative one. We visualize it as this, and this, so like this is, uh, this is one real part, and the imaginary part was 0 0.5. Okay. Then this here, this Pythagorean theorem distance, that's the complex magnitude, that's the amount of that frequency that we have. And that's often what we're going to care about in the class. There's a few other things that I give you hints for on the assignment. It turns out there's some things you can see. If it's a real signal, you're, there are certain properties of these complex numbers. Your, your um, Fourier transform is going to be symmetric, and so we're going to chop it in half. And you'll, you'll see all the details of that stuff. You don't have to understand all the details, because it turns out you're going to use them in the same way in, all the, same, in the problems. And this class isn't about the math, this is about the, the concept. And it turns out with just a little bit of this concept, you can solve a lot of different interesting problems. Uh, and the last thing I should say is maybe fast Fourier transform is the same as discrete Fourier transform. It's just a fast algorithm for it. So uh, that's, um, it turns out that if you look at the definition of the discrete Fourier transform, it's some mathematical thing. If you calculate it according to that mathematical definition, it takes a really long time. But there's a fast way of calculating the exact same numbers, numerical values. It saves you a lot of time. And, uh, and that's why it's called the fast Fourier transform. This was a very important thing, because if you think about the difference between O n squared, if you've taken the pick 10 b and O n log n, that can make a very big difference in terms of execution time, especially when we're talking about something that's involving a ton of data. We've got data points, time, you know, if you're measuring sound, how many measurements do you think you have to take per second in order to get an accurate representation of the sound wave? Sound waves move at very, very fast. So in a single second, it turns out that we typically want to hear about 40, 48,000, uh, 44, 40, either 44, or four, I think it's 44 kilohertz is what they typically sample at. So you've got to take 44,000 numbers per second. Let's say you have a sound recording that's an hour long. That's a ton of data. And if you wanted to take the Fourier transform of that, and your algorithm was order n squared, which means for every data point you have to do, well, for 44,000 data points, you have to do 44,000 squared operations. That's going to take a long, long time. And that's going to be totally infeasible. 
But if it's 44,000 times log of 44,000, that becomes a lot more reasonable. And so that's why fast forward transform is so important. And so realistically on computers these days, they don't use the regular definition of the fast forward, the, of the discrete Fourier transform. They always use the fast algorithm for that. And so we just have, it's become called FFT. Okay. All right, that, that's really all I wanted to say for the math review. Um, I know it's not very mathy for those of you who do know the math behind it, but conceptually I think it, I hope even for the, the math people, maybe this teased you to think about the concept of the Fourier transform in a slightly different way, maybe. It's not just equations and intervals and that sort of thing. It uh, makes some conceptual sense, and you can see how you can solve problems with it. Do you have questions? Yeah? yeah. For, for the salt plate, what's the y-axis represents? Is it frequency or amplitude? Well, in this plot, I was showing the if it's a sound wave, this is the pressure. But then when I started, I could turn this into a plot. Like, let's say that that was a sign. This, this is the sound of an instrument playing a certain note, right? It looks really crazy. That's the sound of an instrument playing a note. And look, it actually, it was kind of repeating, though, right? It's still sort of periodic. And you can actually identify probably the note that it was playing based on these peaks, you'll, you'll see sorts of things like this. Well, if I want to take that with the fast Fourier transform of that, and I want to put that into the what's called the frequency domain, so that each of these numbers is the frequencies. This is frequency one. This is frequency two. Frequency three, etc. How much of each of those? Then this is something like amplitude. How much of this is there? And it's going to be discrete. Because really, we were actually going off of discrete pressure measurements. I've drawn this as a continuous function with lines in between, and so I could do the same thing here, but it's not going to make as much sense here to do that as it does in time. Because this graph can end up being really choppy. You'll find that for a trumpet playing, for instance, you're going to very clearly see those overtones, those like, here's the, the primary frequency, and then here's a line here, there's a lot of this frequency, there's a lot of this frequency, but in between there's like nothing. It's very, it's kind of interesting. It's pretty magical when you do that. And then once you've got these numbers, it turns out you can do the reverse process. If you know how much of each of them is in there, you can do the reverse. You can go from this to that, and I can zero this out and say, I don't want that in there. That's going to change the way it sounds. I'm removing, say, the 60 hertz noise that we talked about before. There's a few few details you need to take care of, and what the meaning of those details are are just not important in this class. You'll see what those are in the assignment. It turns out, well, this was amplitudes. You got to make sure that you you get the you when you do the inverse, you need to turn them back into the complex things again and turn you know do the inverse process on the complex numbers. But that's, that's just details. Conceptually, it's. Others? Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. About what the units are here? Amplitude-ish. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. It's it's not strictly amplitude. Yeah. Nor I was is thinking it about be. the wave amplitude. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's it's not quite strictly the wave amplitude. It's the complex amplitude of that frequency component. Mm -hmm. Because all of these, it's not just simple sines and cosines, they're complex exponentials. And so it's how much do you multiply e to the i omega j uh, times t. How much of that is there? And it's really going to be an a plus b i times that. And so you've got these two. These, this is your coefficient, your complex coefficient is what you're going to end up getting. We're going to take the magnitude of that. So this is the amount of a plus b i. It's like, and so it gets a little bit funny. That's why it's hard to say it's not just how tall is this sine wave? It's a complex number that you're taking the magnitude of. They sometimes call it power, how much power there is in that frequency component. All right, that's the math review then. A little shorter than last time. 